uh, try and lay out our, uh, <laughs> quit pinching that little baby. Try and lay out our future for this year. And uh, I have no idea what the rest of tonight holds, let alone what the rest of the year holds. But I do know who's holding on to the year. And I know who's holding on to our future, both immediate and into the eternal long range uh, look. Uh, two verses in here, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, very, both of them very common, I trust familiar verses. Verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There, there's a flat out statement that I can do that. Now, uh, we, uh, Jim, and, Jim and I were talking in, the, in my office tonight and we're talking about uh, somebody uh, playing the guitar. I said, man, I took lessons. I can't play anything. I've tried several different instruments. I, man, I just got no success at it all. So when I read that verse, I realize it can't possibly mean I can do anything I want to do. But what it does mean is as I have been given everything I need, every uh, level of equipment, every level of provision, every level of uh, blessing from the, the Lord God himself to do everything he needs me to do. So I, I'm limited by this flesh, but I am not limited by God holding out on things and saying, well, you, you just don't know enough to do that. I may not, but God can do everything God wants me to do. Verse 19 kind of, kind of uh, answers the how of all of those things. Verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I doubt if there's too many people in this room tonight who, if they were to go home, could just look around and say, I, I only have what I need or I have just what I need, or I don't have one thing more than what I need. Uh, most of us could probably go home, look around, and have to kick all the junk out of the way that we have. So God has given us far above what we need in this world's goods and in, the, uh, in everything else. But as far as accomplishing what God wants, I am not only enabled and strengthened, I am also provided and provisioned for everything that God has on the table for me to do. And there should be nothing come into my life this year that God has not equipped me to handle, not just to survive, not just to endure, but to overcome in, uh, in his glorious testimony. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll just uh, see if the Lord can't give us something tonight just to, by way of encouragement and by uh, heads up of what's on the what's on the horizon for this year. Father, we do thank you tonight for the precious word of God that is able to remind us uh, how far you went to uh, enable us to accomplish your will. Lord, we thank you that no expense has been spared in the provision for caring for your people. Lord, the old uh, joke and story was God would put the angels on half rations rather than cut back on the needs of a Christian. Uh, Lord, you don't have to cut back on anything to provide all that everyone needs. And we thank you for it. Pray to God that we'd be using the gifts and the calling, the, uh, the expressions you give us from glory and your word to its, to its uh, most glorious benefit and outcome this year. Lord, we just ask you to have your blessing upon us, upon our family. Lord, we are just overjoyed with Herb and Emily's uh, announcement of a baby coming into their, uh, their, their home. We pray that you'd uh, watch over Emily during these next months for her health and for her well-being and Herb and help them both to prepare a, uh, a glorious home for this child to be raised in. And God, we just thank you so much for these little ones that we have here, the ones that are yet to come. God, speak to our hearts tonight. Help us, encourage us. And Lord, just hold us up before this world as examples of your love, of your care, and of your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Often we worry that we're not going to have enough to make it. Or uh, Jesus gave several examples about people who uh, fail to count the cost. Or he warns us uh, by way of... Uh, uh, examples of having counted the cost of what it takes for one army to overcome another and do I have enough of this and enough of that? And then he uh, reminds us that you've got more than enough to be not just, uh, 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 not just uh, endurance uh, people, but overcomers, to be victors. 
to have that victor's crown worn on your head day in and day out. And this world may not see it in the same, uh, same light, may not see victory the same thing, but God certainly has plans for you and I. And uh, I think as, uh, as the world turns, we will see the expressions of those things worked out in our daily life. He's given us everything we need to please Him, and in pleasing Him, we have fulfilled our human potential, our uh, God-given uh, uh, purpose, and every sense that we have as a body uh, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish His will in this earth. His uh, provision uh, runs right back to His generosity. And far too many people are, are wondering what God can't do. You know, I, I, in listening to the news, I marvel that we've, we've spent, God only knows how much money on, on military weapons and training and, and so forth for our, our military. We're battling a third-rate bunch of uh, sand pile dwellers who uh, the biggest uh, thing that they can claim is they like to kill civilians. They're pretty good, uh, pretty good fighters, but they are not anywhere near the same scale uh, that we are. And it's only the restraint of America, and it's the only, only the, uh, uh, the I, I, I'm a little hesitant to say kindness of America, that doesn't just turn that desert to a sheet of glass and uh, say, well, that's that, all done. Uh, they've got those nuclear uh, facilities down under the ground, but they won't be able to get up out of them for the next thousand years. It's just our, uh, America's uh, kindness, in some sense, to not just... Uh, overwhelm them with the force and the power. And yet these people are terrified at every, uh, every a uh, avenue. Uh, that one uh, Hollywood uh, harlot, she says, uh, we just, I just want to apologize for America. Please don't come kill us. Listen, when you have to beg people not to kill you, you, you might get the idea they're really not that friendly to start with and there's something that uh, if they weren't around might be better off for that. I don't know. But Israel was in the same, uh, same uh, feeling of resourcelessness, I guess, and fear at one point. If you look in your Bibles back to Exodus chapter uh, uh, 14, Exodus chapter 14, they'd been prisoners so long that they had Stockholm Syndrome. Everybody know what that is? That's, that's, that's you've, you've been prisoner so long, you've taken affinity with your captives, and you think now, well, they're going to take care of me. And you almost join in with them against the people that are trying to rescue you. And here's God trying to bring them out, and they're, they're trying to cling to the security that they felt they had as slaves uh, while their children are being cast and, and killed uh, because they didn't want, the, the Egyptians didn't want them to, to be outnumbered. In uh, Exodus chapter 14, start reading with me in verse 9, if you would. Uh, but the Egyptians, this is, uh, God's already showed them the plagues. They're about to get out of town here. The uh, Lord's uh, led them away. Uh, Passover night has come and gone, and they're on the, on the road uh, on the way out. And I guess fear is never so great as, a, as at that instant you're about to be rescued or to be delivered. And you think, I made it this far. Am I going to make it the next couple of feet? I, I mentioned before the testimony of men that were on the Indianapolis, the, the ship that delivered the, the nuclear bomb that was going to be dropped on Hiroshima uh, that would end World War II. And uh, their ship was torpedoed. They didn't even send out a radio message. They were under radio silence. And they're left floating in the water for days. And nobody's even looking for them. They're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And finally, uh, somebody realized, we haven't heard anything from these people. Uh, they should be pulling into port. And we, we don't even know where they are. They sent out seaplanes. And the seaplanes went out there. And they found them. And they're out bobbing in little groups out in the, in the Pacific Ocean. The ship had been sunk, and uh, those seaplanes are supposed to land in a nice quiet harbor. They landed on the uh, Pacific Ocean in 20, 30-foot swells, which must have take some piloting, I guess, to, to get them on the, on, the, on the water like that. And as these men are swimming, they'd seen for days their friends being eaten by sharks. And they said the most terrifying part of their entire time was just as they were about to reach for that, 
that pontoon or, or, or have some reach out to somebody's hand that would pull them up on that seaplane where they could rest and be safe out of the water was that terror that a shark is going to come kill me just as they grab my hand and kill me right there. And I think that's probably how Egypt felt. I think that's how a lot of Christians feel. The Lord grabs them and snatches them into glory and they're, yeah, yeah, but the world, the world, forget the world. The world is on God's leash. In verse 9, but the Egyptians pursued after them and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea behind Pethhira and, and before Baal Zephron. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid. I bet they were. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Well, at least they're calling on the right one. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is it not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, we would, than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. I want to say a couple of things right there before we go too far. Number one, every now and then you get a glimpse of Moses that has him as, I don't, I don't even know what's going on. And as a pastor, I can tell you, Man, I see things, and I, man, Lord, I don't even know what you're doing. All I know is what you told us to do. Just keep marching forward. Just keep doing that. And here's Moses. He's the leader. Moses standing there. Here's the ocean on, or the, the Red Sea on this side, and here's the Egyptian army with blood in their eyes behind them. And Moses, uh, anybody know what he's going to do? You don't know what he's going to do then, because he didn't know what he was going to do then. But you know what he says? Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. You know, there's times in life when there's no, you can't do anything but stand still. You haven't got enough directions to go forward. You certainly don't want to go back into the jaws of your enemies in death. You don't want to just run around and panic. They'd already called on the, on the Lord. They did that out of just, I guess, sheer frustration because they'd already told Moses, you're taking us out here to kill us. And Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And Moses is trusting God enough that in the next minutes, hours, maybe a day, God's going to come through with some kind of plan of where do we go from here? Because frankly, God, it's looking a little iffy. <laughs> These guys didn't come out there to help them get across the river. They didn't come out with the pontoon bridges and the sea bees. They came out there with swords and spears and bows to kill them because they didn't want their slaves to escape. Moses... Boy, you talk about faith. He exercised some right then. Because before God gives him an answer, he's believing God's going to get him across that ocean or out of there or get rid of that army or do something. He didn't have any idea what. And you know what? That ought to be our life. That, you want an exciting life. As some people, oh, God, I'd be bored to death being a Christian. No, not really. Being a Christian has got to be one of the most interesting lives that a man could live because you have no idea what God is going to do in you, with you, for you, in spite of you, for the rest of your life. And God can do miraculous things. God can do strange things. God could sometimes stand back and all, in the midst of all your faith do absolutely nothing. And you say, God, where are you? And he said, I'm right here. I'm, I'm watching. I, I got a plan. That is part of the plan. And those people standing still, you say, they should be doing something. Activity is not the answer to God's plan. Being busy about God's plan is, but until he gives it to you, it's just abiding in Christ. Simple faith, believing. Verse 14, he says, The Lord shall fight for you, and, shall, and ye shall hold your peace. So just be quiet. Just be calm. God's going to do the fighting. I don't know where Moses got that from other than I suspect in, uh, in all of the encounters that God had had uh, with Moses, whether it was the, the time on the, uh, on the mount 
whether it was that march uh, from where, he, where God met with him down into Egypt, whether it was the time that uh, Moses is dealing with the children of Israel down there. But I gained one thing from that. It's something that you and I ought to learn. No matter what your problem is, God is not going to leave you high and dry. God is going to do something for you to resolve your issues. And I think uh, we look at a, at a brand new year ahead of us and almost the whole thing on the calendar, you think, how in the world are we going to do this? I don't know, a new baby, a new responsibility, a bigger family. Wow, what are we going to do with this? I don't know what all is going through your mind, but I, I know what went through mine at some point in life. And you think about, what is this all this about? And Lord says, just calm down. Take a look around you. Everybody else managed to get through that. Everybody else managed to do okay. You're here. You're alive. At some point, you thought mom and dad didn't know how to raise kids, but here you are. You've made it so far. You've done a fair job. God's given a fair accounting of himself in your provision. But he says, the Lord shall fight for you. You shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, speaking to the children of Israel that they go forward, that's interesting, isn't it? What's in front of them? Water. Lord, are we going to swim across here with the treasures of Egypt that you've given us? Lord, are we going to swim across here with our little ones, with our flocks? With I don't know how wide the Red Sea is there, but I'm going to suspect it'd be a challenge to swim through that with all of the stuff that they had or even, uh, even without it. But Moses knows God has a plan although God hasn't revealed that plan to him yet. And as he's telling them, go forward. You know what the, the answer to Christian life is? Go forward. It is never go back. Sometimes it's stand still. Sometimes it's turn around and look. Look at where you were. You've come a long way. Sometimes I, I start thinking about where I'm at as a Christian, where I'm at as a, just a man. I look back over my shoulder. I remember what it was when I was lost. I said, Lord, you have brought me a long way. I've got a long way to go, maybe, but I am glad I am not back there. They ought to look back over their shoulder and say, you know what? The midwives that would kill our children, they're back there. The, the torture that we went through back there, building the treasure cities of Egypt, it's all back there. And what lies out ahead is the God that we serve, the God that rescued us. He's going to take us off into the future. He's going to take us into our, our homeland that he's got prepared for us. Isn't that exactly what we're all waiting for? And who knows but what this might be the year that we get it. This might be the year that the Lord comes through and fully delivers on that thing. He says, uh, go forward, don't go back, but lift up the, uh, thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. Hmm. Lord, uh, you know I'm not eloquent, but let me tell you a couple things just here in passing, Lord. This rod here, this is a snake. It, it becomes a snake. You know, remember, Lord, when you told me if I threw it on the ground, it'd be a snake? I never divided any water before. I, I never... Did anything like that before? You say, this, that's not in the text. You think that wasn't going through his mind? What do you mean hold that rod out and over, the, over the sea and divide it? Well, Lord, I can't get more than a couple of inches out into the water here. Everything that just seems so problematic. How many of you have noticed that when you just do what God told you, the problems, they, they're there. But as they appear, they just as quickly kind of go to the side. And somehow, some way, in some minute manner, step by step, God makes a way for you to do just what he told you to do. Go forward. Hold up that rod that the children of Israel should go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And away they went. You and I, we have a real enemy. Lord says that uh, be sober, be vigilant. You're, for your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's pretty scary stuff. 
But I'm glad he says, uh, but you're mine. And don't you worry about that. You just be mindful that he's there. I'll take care of him. You just keep moving forward, moving toward the Lord. Down in verse uh, 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. You know how God got honor over the heathen? The people that didn't, deliver, didn't believe in him? He killed them. <laughs> That's a rough way to do it. They had an option. Pharaoh even asked the right question, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And Moses told him. But he wouldn't. Hardened his heart. You know, let's keep our hearts soft this year. So that whatever we, whatever obstacles, whatever trials we come to, the Lord's able to say, uh, you know who I am. You know what I'm able to do. And I want my victory in your life to be one of glory and honor and privilege, not one of judgment. Verse 19, the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar and the cloud went from before their faces and stood behind them. By most reasonable accounting, there are several million people in Israel at this point. They're all huddled up on this, uh, this uh, waterfront property <laughs> waiting to cross, and they're surrounded on all the land sides by the Egyptian army who does not mean them well. That we wasn't a farewell to Israel. They wanted to kill them all. And God simply brings himself around to protect. He is the rear reward. He's the, the rear guard that is the warden over their welfare. You know, as you and I are walking forward, God says, you got that breastplate of righteousness on. He says, I'll be your cover for the back. You just keep moving. Don't worry about what happens behind you. You just keep moving in the right direction. And uh, verse 20, and, became, and, and came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that uh, the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind that night, and made the sea dry, uh, sea dry land, and the waters were divided. I wonder how long Moses had to stand there. You remember at the, at the battle there at uh, Ai, he's got his hand stretched out there, and Joshua and uh, uh, Aaron come and hold his hand up while he sits on the rock. Man, Moses is getting well up in years by this time. He's 80 years old. It's amazing how, how God doesn't let anybody go by. He says, Moses, you ain't done anything for me, but uh, you're 80 and you still got a few good years left in you. <laughs> I don't know how many I got, but uh, uh, I'm going to hope that there's some hands to help hold me up through this year. I suspect there are, and I know there's a God that's going to hold us all up as we wait for that pathway through this world to open and uh, the clouds come and take us up out of, and away from it. Uh, verse 22, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch, several million people have to walk through this, this pathway through the sea. I don't think it was some little meandering, you know, don't, don't stick your elbows or your shoulders out, you'll get wet, but just kind of slither through there. I think it's probably wide enough they could go through there 20 or 30 wide. I don't know how long of a procession two million people would make, plus animals and flocks and herds, but it'd be significant. And they managed to get through there. And as uh, Pharaoh was watching, he said, we can do what they can do. Isn't it amazing the world thinks they, they're every bit as, uh, as blessed as a Christian? They've got a religion. They've got a pastor. They've got a, what passes to them for a Bible. They've got all that kind of stuff. You know what? But God says, but they're not mine. They're, they're not my responsibility. They are the people I'm going to show. They should have trusted their Moses, whoever God sent to them. 
Verse 24, And it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire uh, and of the cloud and uh, troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels and they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Well, duh, they had just been through 10 plagues that had destroyed their entire nation. All of a sudden it dawns on them. Well, God's on their side. He's against us. You know what? I bet that was a shocker even to Israel. Because what did they think? Moses, you're just following some cloud and some fire up there. We don't know what it is. And I think he just brought us out here to kill us. And we know there's a Lord because we called on him. But we didn't hear anything from him. He says, yeah, but God spoke to somebody and he told them what needed to be done and you just gotta, gotta go along. Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea and the waters may come up again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning, uh, strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh and all that came into the sea after them. There remained no, not so much as one of them. Look at verse uh, 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. You know something? Sometimes God has to put you in just near life or death circumstances before you ever really appreciate who He is and what He's done. And isn't it sad how shortly that lasts? <laughs> You only have to read the next chapter to realize they came out of there singing and shouting and praising God. Man, they had a camp meeting. Everybody was at the altar dedicating their life to the Lord, and they were just happy as could be. They were never going to get away from God. Everything was just, just wonderful, and they sang up His praises till they got thirsty. And then it all started over again. You realize that, that uh, because of the Lord's mercies are new day by day, renewed every morning, we are not consumed. Boy, you know what? At some point, folks, we've got to fix in our minds and in our heart, God is for us. His provisions, uh, they're only for a day, but praise God, when that sun comes up in the morning, the mercies of God come up with it. The grace of God comes up with it. And we've got another day's supply there. That cruise of meal, that preparation of oil that God gives us, there's fresh oil every morning. Everything that you and I have need of, God is in the business of providing for it. That Bible says in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That doesn't say he might. It says he will. God didn't put a condition on that other than drawing nigh to God. The closer we get to God, the more security we enjoy. Now, the, having said that, the bigger the target you are and the wider that sea might appear, but that rod hasn't lost its strength and the God that gives direction has not lost any of his wits in all of these years. He's still able to take care of an our entire army just by his word, just by his own strength and power. Romans 16, 20, Paul ends, within the God of peace shall bruise uh, Satan under your feet shortly. But preacher, it's been 2,000 years. Well, that's two days in God's, uh, God's lexicon. A thousand years is a day. A day is a thousand years with the Lord. A long time for us. But it's nothing to God. You know what God's done? He's delivered His church down through the ages. There's been trials. There's been uh, wide seas. There have been opportunities for the Egyptians to, to, to get them all puckered up at the, at the ocean. And they all came through. Say, well, if they didn't come through on that shore, they landed on the golden shores of glory, safe and sound, never to be troubled again. What a great God we have. Let's be sober. Let's be vigilant. We've got a real enemy. But you know what? We've been equipped We've got provision to deal with that enemy. God himself will fight for us. God himself will take our part. All we need to do 
to stay close to him. Look with me over in Psalm 78. Psalm 78 uh, is kind of interesting. A couple of things, just a, a, a two-minute Bible lesson here and back to preaching. Psalm 78, verse 1 and 2, it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parable. In a parable, I will utter dark sayings of old, which uh, we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. And what he gives after this uh, telling you it's going to be a parable is Israel's history. So it's interesting that Israel, Israel's history is a parable of the world and how it turns, how it goes, how God cares for it. And uh, Israel, they were worried about getting across that sea, how that was going to happen, how they were going to escape the Egyptian army. God sent uh, uh, Moses with a rod to hold out there and, and uh, open that sea up. He gave them 10 plagues to judge the gods of Egypt and, the, and Pharaoh and destroy them and uh, have them uh, pay Israel to leave. Isn't it amazing what they wanted to do in the first? They wouldn't let them do. But by the time God was through the heathen, they were giving gold and silver to the, to the Israelites so they would leave. Imagine getting paid to leave. Kind of like uh, Pharaoh's daughter paying Moses' mother to take care of him. How in the world are we going to afford this baby? We're in a world where they want to kill all the babies. What are we going to do now? Trust God. Stand still and watch God take care of it. Next thing you know, Pharaoh's paying the bills at, uh, at uh, Jochebed's uh, bedside. That's a pretty good God we serve, you know what? We are way unworthy of his care and attention. In Psalm 78, verse 19, Israel, uh, they got through that. And uh, here they are. They're on the other side of the uh, the Red Sea, and they're looking around and saying, man, they ain't a grocery store within 100 miles of this place. There's no water down here. All we got is that sea salt. What in the world are we going to do? And down here in verse 9, it says, uh, verse 18 rather, it says, uh, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat in their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? <laughs> Could he? Forty years worth. Forty years of God feeding two million people. Forty years of God saying your shoes didn't even wear out, did they? Well, no. Do you ever wonder, well, in 40 years, didn't they grow out of them? Wouldn't it be something that uh, uh, Steve and Ann are, are, are about to step into this. The kids now are, are about to hit that growth spurt. When it seems like every time you turn around, they need new shoes. They don't wear them out so much as just grow out of them. Forty years, their shoes didn't wear out. Imagine a hand-me-down shoes from, from your grandfather. God took care of those people. His provision was not, oh my goodness, two million people. What am I going to do out here? There's not enough water out here. I've got to get them someplace to get them water. All God says is, see that big rock over there? Moses, go over there and hit that rock. water flows out. If everybody had a gallon a day, that's two million gallons of water. That's a lot of water out of a rock. Well, I just don't believe water could come out of a rock. Well, I guess you would have died of thirst then. And somebody would have got your share. I think God is just so spectacular in the way that he delivers. And you know what he does all this for? To Israel, it was for a sign. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Go pick up that manna. Doesn't matter how much you pick up, you're going to have enough. You're never going to have extra. You're going to have enough. Do you ever wonder what they thought? They kept it one night, thinking, well, I'm going to have to get up early in the morning, go out and get it. And it turned into worms. It just bred worms. But then the, another day comes along, and it's just fine that day. And it's just fine that day for the next 40 years. You say, what's that? God just showing them. He's cap well capable of doing everything exactly as he says. He doesn't forget in that 40 years. He didn't have one day that he, oh, God, you know what? I forgot to protect the manna today. 
every single day, God came through on his promises. Every single day, God preserved Israel. They spake against God and they said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? These are the same people that saw God destroy the most powerful nation on earth with grasshoppers and frogs. <laughs> God has some very unusual means of warfare, doesn't he? Anybody read, uh, uh, Just I'm trying to think of where it was. I want to say sub-Sahara Africa, a plague of locusts, the biggest that they've seen in 70 years. Those things come through there and there's gazillions of them and they just eat everything in sight. John the Baptist would have thought it was a heavenly heyday. <laughs> but for everybody else, it's panic. God doesn't have to exert himself very much to frustrate man's best plans. This is the same God that opened that ocean and led him out, judged an entire army without ever lifting a finger himself. Just let the waters, uh, Moses, close the pond. Pools closed for the day. Nobody else coming in. And they're all gone. You know, the Bible says the things that happened unto them were examples unto us upon whom the ends of the world are come. I look around, I say, Lord, if the end isn't near, God help us. What is it going to be like when it is? We've got little ones to take care of. And Egypt feigned that same phoniness of worrying about the children. You find out evil people always use children. You can go, but leave the children here. It'd be too hard for them out there. We don't, you can't expect children to do well in that environment. God says, I can take care of my children better than anybody in this world can. And I expect to be well cared for by him this year. I expect you will too. Sometimes God just puts you a place where you have no way to go but to trust him and to learn to trust him. God is dependent on no circumstances. He makes the circumstances. God brings to pass things. Why don't you look at verse 41, 41 of that chapter. Psalm 78, 41. This, this might be one of the most interesting verses that you'll ever come across in your own life if you can keep the perspective right on it. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not His hand, nor the day when He delivered them from the enemy. And then it goes on about His signs in Egypt in the next verse. In verse 44, the rivers turned into blood. Verse 45, the flies and the frogs. 46, the caterpillars. And 47, the hail and the frost. 48, thunderbolts. And they forgot all that. You know what you do when you don't trust God? You limit God. We're to walk by faith. God says, told the, the Jews, every place when you go in that land that the sole of your foot treads, I'm going to give it to you. But you got to get walking. Get moving. Go. Go forward. As they went, they found out even those giants were no match for them. The fortress cities they could come down or God could turn over the walls and let them in uh, at his will. You and I need to, to really come to grips with the fact that God is interested in us. God has our welfare at hand. God is willing to show this world what he will do with us when, when we obey him and follow closely. Not for spectacular signs to the world, but for spectacular reason to us who have trusted him as he shows his faithfulness to us. The preacher, I was, I was really hoping that by this time in church, we'd have all these seats filled up. Lord's working on it. He's doing a pretty fair job. We've had uh, six people voted in as members here quite recently. Thrilled to death. Say, well, we don't have hardly more than that here. Not at one time. But everybody didn't uh, 
than give up just because they're not here. We will need soldiers for the battle. Let me ask you something. How many soldiers did Moses need to part that Red Sea? Well, he did it all by himself. Think about that. Moses, uh, through the agency of God, I, I don't want to give you the idea that Moses was the man and if it was without him, God said he could raise up somebody else in Moses' place or he could throw away Israel and produce a whole new nation with one man. It's God in every case, at every turn. It's not us. It's God willing to show his power through us, for us, over us, to this world. Soldiers for the battle. The Bible uh, tells us that uh, we might be few in number, but fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is your father's good pleasure to show forth his glories in those few that have been uh, brought into the beloved son. Where are the spiritual warriors of today? Well, in Gideon's day, <laughs> in the book of Judges, Gideon said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, uh, uh, be with us. Why, if you be with us, why has all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Why were they delivered into the hand of the Midianites? For not trusting the Lord. You go back there, that, man, that's, that's where all these arms treaties come from. They, even up into the kingdom days of Israel, uh, man, every time somebody got an upper hand on them, they took away everything with a sharp point on it. They took away all the files. If you wanted to get something done, you had to go down with government permission to get your uh, mattox filed or your, your plowshare sharpened. You had to go to somebody else. Uh, man, do you think people would learn that the government is not necessarily on your side in this thing? God trusts his people with those things. It's the enemies of God that don't trust them. Isn't that what everybody wants to know today? If the church is so powerful, why are we in this mess? Anybody know how many churches there are in America? I don't have any idea. I'm just curious. I was hoping somebody would have a good answer for me. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of them, no doubt. How many of those hundreds of thousands of churches you suppose have sound doctrine in them? How many of them have the right Bible in them? How many of them are really have preachers that believe God's going to do what he said he'd do in a King James Bible? Probably a quarter. I think you were just the wildest optimist I've ever seen. If it's 10%, if it's 5%, I bet that's a lot. That's not an exaggeration. As far as I know, in Connecticut, there's probably two, three, maybe five churches that actually believe what that Bible says. The rest of them say things. The rest of them spout off about believing it. There's just no evidence that they actually believe it. They depend on their sophistication. They do it. depend on their programs. They depend on their people. They're not depending on God. And I'm not saying that to condemn anybody. I'm just saying that to state the obvious. God says, I can do what I need to do with one person if I need to do it. I can use an army should I choose. Gideon thought he was in a pretty rough shape when he only had 32,000 people come down there to ready to go to battle. And God said, man, that's way too many. We, we got we to gotta wean this, uh, thin this crowd out. And before he's done, how many did Gideon have? 300 people. And he's got to be looking around. And he sees the armies of the Midianites and all that crowd out there. I mean, they're just covering the, the land. Oh, God must have some plan going here. Did he? Oh, yeah, yeah. And when he laid out that plan before Gideon, Gideon was stunned. Gideon's, uh, I, I don't know what he was thinking, but if it, I just kind of put myself in that, in that position. What would I think? 300 of us. Yeah, we're going to be up there as witnesses to God miraculously bringing a big cloud over this bunch. Just rain and hail and fire and brimstone and lightning going to fry them all. And God says, well, I never even thought about that. That'd, that'd be pretty impressive. But God says, oh, what I want you to do is get you, get you a jar, an empty jar. 
oh yeah, we're gonna fill it up with napalm and explosives. And, no, 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 no. He said, I want you to get you a lamp. Oh yeah, we've got to light that stuff with something. No, 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 just get a light. Then what? Put it in the jar. It starts to sound like a strange plant, doesn't it? And he says, now get up around the hills there. Okay, three of us got all those multitudes surrounded. Okay, God, what are we going to do next? He says, well, you got a trumpet with you, right? Yeah, 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 we got a trumpet. He says, when I tell you, you blow that trumpet and break those jars and let that light shine. Oh, yeah, that'll work. You realize how crazy that sounds? And when you tell a, a lost man today, you tell most saved people that today. They look at you like, yeah, what was God thinking? God was thinking, I'm going to show you what I can do. You think it depends on the multitude of people? You think it depends on the volume or the amount of money that you got or how much training or how much force or how much anything you got? He says, I'm going to tell you what it depends on. It depends on you doing what I told you to do. When they broke those jars, those people down on the plains panicked. All they could think of is God. That's none but Gideon and his armies. And God has come to kill us all. And they did exactly what God put in their hearts. Every man's sword was against his brother. They started killing each other. They panicked. They ran. And Israel starts coming out of the woodwork and chasing after. A great victory that day. Why? Because one man listened to God and 300 men joined him in the craziest plan you ever heard to defeat an enemy army. And God got the victory. God has a winnowing process of just who to see who is going to follow him. 22,000 fearful and afraid were dismissed. Go home, guys. This battle's too tough for you. Too big for you. 10,000 men left and were tested. 300 men lapped like a dog who were left to defeat the Midianite army. You may not have got what that means. <laughs> say, well, why did God choose that? I don't know. Maybe he knew the, the uh, people in the army were going to call, be called dog face years later. You ever wonder about that? God's got a plan, doesn't he? He says, you want to see a victorious army? I showed you mine. So we name ours after them. You have dog tags, dog face. <laughs> Get treated like a dog. <laughs> God has got a good sense of humor, I think, but he's got a great plan. And it includes you and I. And in this coming year, you and I may be exercised right to the maximum level about what this is all about. Those vessels were empty, but they had what God needed in them, light. Those vessels had to be broken for that light to be seen by somebody. And you and I, when we're hale and hearty and sound and sturdy and doing well, where's the testimony of God give me strength? Where's that vision of, man, I may not have any strength, but God give me the power to do what you want me to do. When that old body's frail and broken and weak and tired, all of a sudden those, that little lamp and that little light that we give certainly reveals a whole different nature to us than the world saw before. If we're able to lift up our voices like a trumpet and show our people their sin, show those people their sin, and show them the remedy, it just could be that this might be the year God says, uh, I'm going to give you a great victory. It could be the year that God fills the seats up. It could be the years that God takes half of the people away that are sitting in them. There's the test that Gideon had. I hope not. All I know is, is this. God is faithful and he says we are to be overcomers. And our overcoming is not in our own strength, our own power, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And if we will follow the Lord, we will have a victorious, glorious year. God gives us something today for victory. It's grace. 
far too many Christians think today, you know, it's different today, preacher. You got to do this to get people out. You got to have that program to get people out. You got to have the, the rock and roll music. You've got to have the contemporary service. You've got to have the, the uh, traditional service. And you've got to have something that's probably crazy in between those things anymore because you've got to have enough people to pay the bills. I'm going to tell you something. If God don't pay his own bills, God will have unpaid bills. You and I cannot produce a sideshow that will in, in, uh, enhance or in, entrance people to come in and expect God to do any real work here, anything for us. And quite frankly, you and I need the Lord. We desperately need his advice, his guidance, his counsel, his power, his strength, his wisdom, his understanding of our uh, various and uh, varied circumstances. And you know what God gives? God gives grace. Malachi 3, 6 says, I'm the Lord, I change not. The same grace he gave to, to, to wicked Israel. He holds out to the church today. He says, all you got to do is just follow me. Not hard, not tough. Just be glad you're with me. Paul cried out to the Lord and he said, I'm an apostle. How's it going to look if I, if I can't have any health to go spread the word? You know what God told him? He said, yeah, I heard you. I heard you all three times. Paul might be thinking, well, well why didn't you answer? You know, that sign that, of raising the dead and healing the sick and all that was so that people would believe you. How are they going to believe you if your own messenger can't do that? God says, I'm over that now. We're moving away from that phase of the church. I want people to believe me just because who I am. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And the ability to, to withstand suffering, the ability to withstand temptation and pain and all of the, the, the things that none of us are looking for this year. You put a list of all of the things you want on one side and all the things you don't want on the other, and all those things that you don't want may be what God uses to bring victory for himself and for you and I this coming year. I hope not. I, I honestly do. Man, I'm not praying for bad things. Every now and then, somebody will say, well, I don't even know what to pray for your wife anymore. I, in, in a certain instance, I am with you. I don't either. All I know is, is this, I'm going to pray for what I want. And what I want is I want her to feel better. I want her to have some relief. I want God to help her. Anybody find a problem in that? then we do know what to ask. We ask what we want. That's not selfish. That's not, Lord, I don't want her to get up and run a marathon so she can bring home a trophy. I want her to be healthy so she's not suffering. I want her to have a life. I'd love her to be able to come back and sit in church and sing with us. And uh, We used to sing a song, All Hail Emmanuel. I, Janice and John probably remember that. It was one of the real high kind of Man, my wife could carry that whole song just about all by herself. I'd sing that, man, I'd just have goosebumps run up and down my back. All hail Emmanuel. We cast our crowns before thee. I haven't heard that song in 15 years. I miss her being able to sing like that. You think the Lord's going to heal her? I have no idea, but I'm not going to stop asking. Bible says you have not because you ask not. Keep asking. I've heard many uh, Christians describe the church age as the age of grace. And that's not untrue. But it's not altogether right. Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. What did Adam deserve? Didn't he get grace? Abel? I mean, what had he ever done that was so great that God says, well, you just can't argue with that. He needed grace. Noah comes along. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You look at every man that's ever lived. You know what he needed? He needed grace. and God gave it in abundance. We're going to need it this year. As much, maybe more than ever. Even wicked Lot found grace in God's eyes. God says he was a righteous man. Hard, hard to gather. 
Moses, even under the law, he was the lawgiver. Couldn't depend on keeping the law. He needed grace. Several times, God and Moses are on, on opposite sides. Several times, they're on the same side, arguing about whether to get rid of Israel and kill them all and start over, or whether they're going to make a nation out of Moses. Thank God they never agreed entirely on that situation because they both found grace in the eyes of the Lord. David's sin, you read through the, the book of Leviticus, what sin, what uh, sacrifice did you give for a murderer? How did you appease God once you'd murdered somebody? There isn't any. There's none listed. The Bible says you shall accept no, uh, uh, no offering for a murderer, no, no uh, sufficiency for it. Well, how in the world did David manage to stay on the throne and receive God's blessing? In his repentance, he found grace. And God powered him on. God led him on. Grace has never been limited by an age. As long as man is alive, he'll need grace. Until man is completely transformed, body, soul, and spirit, grace is the evident uh, call that God gives. I'm glad he doesn't change. And we're going to need that in this coming year, probably like never before. Psalm 84, 11, it says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He is the provision for all our needs, all of the time, always. 360 days left this year till we're standing here again, New Year's, New Year's evening. What's the year going to be? It's going to be a year filled with God's mercy. It's going to be a year scattered with God's grace on near everybody that will ever come to Him. It's going to be a year of trials and tribulations and toil and any other T letters you can think of. But it's also going to be a year of overcoming victory in some lives. Let's let it be us. Let's choose that victory. Let's draw nigh to God and have him draw nigh to us. And let's not let him get away. And let's let, not let ourselves slip away from that drawing. Let's stand. I don't know what you have need of tonight. All I know is, is this. There's a God in heaven that provides it all. And what you've got to do is get in contact with him and he'll see to your needs. Number 157, Jesus paid it all. The bill for everything we need, paid. <laughs> Lord, not running short on cash. He's not running short on anything. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills. He owns the mineral rights all the way to the center of the earth and a trillion suns. He's not going to have a tough time taking care of us. We're just going to have a time staying close. Let's make it a good year. I hear the Savior say,